Our God and Heavenly Father, we have to once again thank you that you have assembled us here and we do quieten ourselves now into your presence. We do thank you that you have been given us access into this grace, into the very throne room of our God. We thank you that you have done all this to wrought out that work of salvation in eternity past. We thank you that you have <coughs> shed your blood to secure us access into the grace that we now stand and we are grateful for that. And we come as people with a hunger and a desire to learn more of you, to understand the greater wisdom of your word, and we just pray your blessing upon it now. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be present in this room, that your attendance would be marked and noted by everyone, that you would honour your name, that you would glorify yourself, that you would feed your people and do good to your sheep. We ask your blessing now as we gather before your word. We ask it all in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. One thing I forgot to mention last week, just as a tail end of it, you notice that Saul gathered all the men to battle, and he assembled uh, an army of 330,000 men. I forgot to mention that was really that was a, a fulfilling of a prophecy that Samuel had marked a couple of chapters before, when he warned them, if you're going to get a king, he's going to take your sons. And it wasn't until we got to chapter 11 that we found the fulfilment of that prophecy, that he did in fact take 330,000 of their men conscripted them to the army there. But we're moving on this week to chapter 12, and we'll start by reading the chapter as usual then. So chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12. The Bible's ready. There we go. Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. Now... Here is the king walking before you, and I am old and grey-headed, and look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? And whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? And I will restore it to you. And they said, You have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you may not have found anything in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron, and who brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I might reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers out of Egypt to make them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, <coughs> commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Amorites, came against you, you said to me, No. But a king shall rule over us when the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you desired. And take note, the Lord is set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call on the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And 
And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins the evil of asking the king for ourselves. And Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Now therefore, or sorry, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. That's the reading of God's word in chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. This chapter breaks down almost in two halves, not quite uh, equal halves, but the first 15 verses are one section, and then we move on to the following 10 verses, the second section. But the first half, if I can call it that, breaks down into three sections. You might say, first of all, it's kind of the trial and the vindication of Samuel, and then secondly, it moves on to the accusations and the charges and the guilt of Israel that he lays against them. And then thirdly, it's the I call it the accommodation or the acquiescence of God in all these things. But first of all, to begin with, Samuel has to make a, some level playing field here. First of all, before he can lay charges of Israel, he has to clarify that he's the man who's able to do so. He has to obtain, first of all, their, their testimony that it vindicates him of any wrongdoing. We can't have them saying, yes, but what about you? Uh, well, you did this and you did this. He has to clarify, first of all, that he's a man who's entitled to make these allegations against them. So he does that. First of all, in verse 2, he says that he can't deny the fact that he's old. That's a given. They did say before that, you're, you're old. Well, I can't deny that. Certainly, I am an old man there. And it's true that my sons are before you. But what about his career? <clears throat> what about Samuel as a leader there? All right, let's do this then. Bring your evidence. Let's open up all the files then. Let's take accounts of it. What accounts have I laundered then? What have I ever taken from anybody then? Let's read all the emails. Let's check out all the phone taps then. Let's go through all the records of my office here. Who have I fleeced? Who have I oppressed there? What have I ever done against anybody? Did I steal anybody's donkey? Have I taken any bribes? And they have to say, in verse 4, they can see that he's never put a foot wrong. There's never been any inappropriate behaviour from Samuel's office, and there's never any defect in his character. Even from childhood, he's been a man of exemplary character and standards. So we've clarified that. Samuel is a man who's entitled to speak like this thing. So having clarified that, and witnesses on record, Samuel turns immediately from the defendant, and he becomes the prosecutor. And not only he says that not only have I been faithful, but the Lord's been faithful to you as well. And he goes on to rehearse all the Lord's righteous acts there throughout the whole of the history of this nation there. And the first thing he says is, Stand still, that I might reason with you before the Lord. I kind of like that phrase. I've glanced onto it a little bit this week. Don't you wish sometimes that people that you know, maybe the children in your family, you just wish sometimes they would just stand still so you could reason with them. Stop bobbing and weaving and ducking and diving. Stop evading all your excuses. Stop hiding behind your excuses. Stop evading taking your responsibilities before God. Stop burying yourself in any manner of stupid activities. Put your phone down. Stop telling me the silly things you've read on the internet. Now what about this and what about that? Just stand still and heed the warnings of scripture that's going to be pertinent to your life. Don't come back to me with these silly platitudes. Come out from that refuge of lies that you built and stand still and let's reason together. Samuel says it. Isaiah said it. Wash yourselves, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings before your eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they should be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the swords. From the mouth of the Lord it is spoken. We read that in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16, very famous there. 
Samuel goes on to point out that the cycle that we've seen before last year, we saw repeatedly in the book of Judges there, that people backslide and fall into idolatry and God delivers them up into the hands of their enemies. And they find themselves in a crisis there and they cry out to God for help and he raises up a, a leader and a deliverer there and he sets them free and they go in liberty again. And it's not long before they backslide again and they fall into idolatry and we had that constant cycle. And Samuel here in this chapter recites that to them. He starts out with saying, The Lord brought you out of Egypt by Moses and Aaron. And then in verses 9, 10, and 11, he says, You forgot the word, you forgot your God, and you worshipped Baal, and he sold you into Sisera, as we saw in Judges, and into the hands of the Philistines. He cried out for help, and he raised up judges. It says there, Jeroboam, we know him better as Gideon. And it says then, Bedan, who we, by translation, that might have been Barak, who worked with, uh, with Deborah, but he might have been some other. Job that's not a job, judge that's never been recorded in the scripture, we just don't know. And there was Jephthah and Samuel, and the margin says that might have been Samson in that case there. And he told them again and again how God this one. And now we get to verse 12, and he says, Nahash. <laughs> yeah, of course, Nahash. This is the recent one. Have you noticed that the most recent crisis is always the worst one, isn't it? <laughs> it's always the hardest thing. We all do this one. The current Emergency is always far worse than anything we've faced ever before. How quick it is that we develop amnesia for everything God's done for us over the years and the decades of our lives. We forget to recount all God's faithfulness over time and on our own history of there. And Samuel in effect says here, Now behold, there's Nahash threatened to turn you all into one-eyed, optically challenged veterans there. And what do you do? You didn't cry out to the Lord. You ignored him. And you slighted him and you cried out for a king. In spite of all the centuries of history of God's proven faithfulness and goodness and the wonders he showed you, that you, you turn instead to this untried, unproven, fallible, pretty boy farmer's son to form a new kind of government to you, all in the hope that you would wriggle out from under the hand of this God's rule and God's reign. All right, you've got two choices now. <coughs> This is the way it's going to be. Uh, you are still under God's rule and God's reign there, he says in verse 13. And in 14 he says you've got two choices. You can either live faithfully under God's word, or you're going to suffer justly under his hand. And that's a word for all of us here. Same now, in that day and age. We either live faithfully under God's word, or we will in this life and the next suffer justly under his hand. I don't know if you were like me, we often fall into this unbelief there. The latest crisis is always the one that we face. It's always this time that he can't provide for us there. No provision for us, he's got this time there. I don't know <coughs> me only, but I found this to be recently true of myself. That we, we don't do it like a nationwide hoo-ha that we're reading in this chapter. With us, it's just quiet and silent and low-key and shamefully fatalist just as much. I even found this in myself yesterday. We've got a question that's arisen in our house and home there with something we we're thinking about. And there's something we would like the, door, the Lord to do for us which consists of four components. And I even said it to my wife yesterday. I'm, I'm just struggling to find the faith that the Lord can actually do these one, two, three, four things to bring this together for us. I've had a rich life. I've done an awful lot in my life. I've lived on both sides of the world, of the Atlantic. I've run businesses, raised a family. I've had a good life, and I've seen a great deal in my life, and I'm sure you have as well. But now, now, this thing we're facing there, I can't believe that the Lord can do one, two, three, four things because he doesn't have enough money, he doesn't have enough resources, or he doesn't have the heart to be that kind to us. And I actually said it out loud to my wife, and I've now confessed it to you as well. Hope I'm not the only one here. I'm sure we're all the same there. Having said all this then, Samuel doesn't even pause to take breath in case they start spouting some religious tripe and nonsense to get out of it and escape acknowledging their guilt there. Have you ever tried to reason with some rebellious teenager in your own life or somebody who won't listen? And you can make a perfectly sound, airtight case there based on logic and argument. You've got no loopholes, you've done a really good job, there's no escape routes and they still refuse point blank to accept the truth of it there. Samuel knows this one. He's a wise man. He knows he's going to take a little bit more than just verbal truths on this one. He's going to need some visual aids to drive the message home there. And he knew it. And he knows this one and he 
He backs it up, lickety split. He says the announcing that the Lord is going to bring something happen. He's going to make it rain and he's going to make it thunder in harvest time. That's like me saying it's going to get 12 inches of snow in July in the Sahara Desert. It just doesn't happen. But Samuel's saying this one. And we get it. There's a storm. It's a storm. It's a sign. It's a sign to these people that although they wanted to get rid of God, he can and he will still exercise his right to rule over the covenant of people, whether they like it or not. He's not going to let them go. And whilst they're gathering or just about to gather in their harvest there, he's going to bring this back on them just to show just how easy it is for him to destroy in one hour what they've been working on and nurturing for months. God is still upon his throne. This is impressive proof that they are still in the all-powerful, almighty hands of God. Those covenant curses that we read about in Deuteronomy, they're not just official words on a religious document that's stuck away in the archives there. These are the real threats of a real living God who has the right to impose them anytime he wishes even at the most inconvenient time of a harvest there. So in verse 18 it says, It thundered and it rained and they were afraid. <coughs> Good. Verse 19, they finally got the message. Finally got it. The charges of Samuel have been collaborated by God's storm. Sometimes it's only when we see our sin from God's point of view that there's any hope that we might turn from them. Noticed a line that I picked up here, God very often works this one. He'll work very firmly to make sure we see and understand our sin. And very often he sends misery to be the agent of repentance. Misery, the agent of repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter, 10, verse, chapter 7 verse 10, Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted. I wonder if the master did this as well. Yeah, I think so. I noticed a couple of weeks ago I was reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. I don't know if you noticed the conversation was going very well. And they were speaking at some time and he got her interested enough to ask about this gift of living water. And she asked for it. And she got that far with the process. She even got her to ask to, uh, for this gift of living water. So he might never thirst again. And she asked for that in the verse 15 of that one. And then Jesus says to her instantly, well, yes, all you have to do then is just give your heart to the Lord. All you've got to do then is just accept Jesus into your life. All you have to do is fill in this card, repeat this prayer after me, just walk down the aisle and all will be well then. If you can just get them to confess in something that they've never believed in, if you can get them to profess something they've never felt, then all will be well. If you can just get people to act piously, even though they're still poor. That's all that needs to be done. No. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, well, that's all well here. All he said then was, she said, give me this water that I might not thirst. And he said, go call your husband. <laughs> Ooh. Did you see the video? Did you see her eyes hit the floor? I don't have a husband. That's right, you don't have a husband. You had five husbands, and the man you're shacked up with now isn't your husband either. That's not good evangelism, is it? <laughs> you're going to make her feel very uncomfortable. She might run away with that. No, he immediately confronts her with her sin. He's not doing it just so he can dig into the gory details of her life to make her squirm and make her feel uncomfortable. No, this is our Lord who's gentle and lowly of heart. But our Lord Jesus knows that there comes a time when sin has to be confronted and it has to be dealt with. How do you preach to a man about the cure for a deadly disease if he doesn't even know he's got the disease? I've got a cure for Cronin's disease here for you. I'm going to give it to you for free. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> You're a nutcase. What do I want that for? No, you've got Cronin's disease. I can see it on your skin. I can see it in your eyes. I can tell. I've been researching this my whole life. You've only got a couple of months to live. I've got the cure for it. That's different. First of all, we've got to understand that. David knew about this. We need to understand and become aware that we've sinned against a holy God and there is an account to be paid for and there will be justice must be served. We've sinned against heaven. David knew this one. After adultery and murder, he says, I have sinned against heaven and done this evil in your sight. 
Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? And the prodigal son said the same thing, I have sinned against heaven there. And even the Apostle Paul, he preached a repentance towards God. If a man doesn't understand that he sinned against God, he's only going to exercise a very superficial repentance. In the first storm that comes along, the first trial, the first tribulation that persecution comes, he's gone, he's faded away, this is too much for him. Biblical evangelism is always law to the proud and grace to the humble. You never see the Lord Jesus Christ giving the gospel, or giving the cross or the good news to the proud and the arrogant man, not to the self-righteous man. The law, he breaks the heart and with the gospel, he heals the broken hearted. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We read in 1 Peter 5 and 7. And there's actually 20 or 25 other verses in Scripture uh, on the same theme there. I can give you some in Psalm 138, 6, and Proverbs 3.34, Matthew and James 4, 6 as well. Many, many verses which say exactly that same precept over and over again. That God gives grace to the humble and not to the proud. And God causes us to see our sin and make us tremble and stand before a holy God. And it's just so he can make us quake and fear and tremble. But so that we can be fear and be restored. It's the kindness and the severity of God that Paul speaks about in Romans 11 verse 12. And that's it, uh, verse 22 and that's grace. Verse 19 we turn a corner there which says pray for us. <laughs> I've noticed a difference here. I found this one. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I got up early yesterday morning, was sitting on the couch and thinking about this. I think, oh, I've got enough material for tomorrow. I need something more. And I just went over the chapter for the 94th time. And again, I think the Lord showed something that I didn't see in the previous week's study there. There's a difference here between, verse, between here in verse 19 and verse 10. In verse 10, when Samuel is talking and recounting God's righteous acts in past generations, he says that the previous generation said that they realised their sin and they cried out to the Lord. And here in verse 19, these people are merely asking Samuel to pray for them. You see the difference? There's a distance now. They're one step removed there. They're not crying out to the Lord, they're asking somebody else to pray for them as well. And this struck a chord with me. My wife and I have an example about this in our own lives, just uh, towards the tail end of the last year, I think it is. We know somebody back in Calgary that we've known for some time. It was a young person, similar age to you, uh, born and raised and grew up in a godly Christian home and God-fearing parents. And it wasn't much older than you guys here that they came to of age. They decided they didn't want any more of this one. And they clearly turned their backs on the church and upon God's people and upon the Lord and they walked away from it all and it was only a matter of time before they started to become more and more antagonistic towards the Lord's people and towards the things of God, particularly against God's people. And there are some of us who will continue to pray for this person, who obviously I'm not going to name there. We pray for them constantly, but it was obviously futile as well to keep arguing with them even though it was clear they were actively spoiling for a fight and looking for trouble on all the usual points of contention. You know, how can you Christians are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites? Well, yeah, it's true, we are. But so are all you. <laughs> we're all the same. But what about abortion? What about a woman's rights? And all this old chestnuts coming out of it. Shouldn't a woman have the right if the baby if it's a child of a rape or something like that? And aren't you Christians always supposed to love each other? And if I was all about God is a God of love, if two people of the same sex love each other, why shouldn't they be allowed to go? And it was just utterly pointless to contend and argue with these people about these things. In fact, it's actually, actually against the biblical truth there. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 23, says, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Titus says something similar, but avoid foolish <coughs> disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject the devices man after the first and second admonition. Just a rule of thumb here. <coughs> Don't waste your time arguing people about silly things. Don't argue with them about where Cain got his wife from. Don't 
argue about the impossibility or the difficulties of God getting all the animals and how do you get all those animals into the ark there. Don't waste your time arguing about the middle toe on the left foot of Daniel's uh, great image in his dream there. Don't waste your time on these things. If you explain those things here, no, now the satellite has seen an image of Noah's ark in the middle of a mountain in Turkey. Oh, the Bible must be true then. Then I'm going to repent. And believe, no, they don't. <laughs> You just argue that one, then another one, and another one, and another one there. The only thing we can do there is just tell them the gospel and leave it with the Holy Spirit to bring them back to life then. It has to start with the cross. It has to start with the narrow gate. No other arguments are going to get anything. But when that situation I was talking about, it just got worse and worse and Still the people of God who were couldn't call up, they refused to be baited into this argument and just kept praying for this person. And we had to stand back and watch their life getting worse and worse and falling deeper into trouble. Deeper and deeper it was very clear that the pain that was being brought upon them, the Lord was very obviously applying pressure to this person in all areas of their life. And it was kind of good to see, although you would sympathise with their agonies they're going through. You know they're bringing upon them by this rebellion and their lives. And then one day a phone call came and this person was in utter despair. Some other tragedy had hit their life. And then it came through the tears. It came, please pray for me. And of course we did. But at the same time you want to think with the cheek of it to ask. <laughs> you've been railing against God's people. You've been railing against him. Antagonizing everybody you can do. And obviously we did pray for it. It's just so awful to see this one. No, it doesn't begin with somebody else praying with you. How about you get on your knees and you pray for yourself? Maybe the real answer will be there if you started there. Maybe if you started to surrender this fight and bowed in submission and repentance before the God that you've offended, or you just wanted to let him off you a hook, or you just wanted to let him take his pressure off you so you can carry on your sinful way with impunity. Is that what you're really after? Anything you can do rather than have to speak to him and deal and do business with him with yourself there. Verse 19 he says, we have done all this sin, but if you will pray for us that we might not die. They don't want to change, <laughs> they just don't want to die. That's not true repentance there. But what does God say when he has reduced these people there to know their own spiritual disaster? When he comes and he strips us all of our camouflage and of our fig leaves just so that we can see our nakedness before him. What's the first thing he said when we haven't done that in verse 20? The first thing he said, do not fear. <laughs> you have done all this wickedness, but do not fear. There's still a future. <coughs> There's still a hope. You might have soured your life. You might have stained your testimony, certainly beyond excuse, but it's not beyond forgiveness. You don't go wallowing in your misery of that great sin that you fell into all those years ago there. Don't keep going on in perpetual misery as if that is going to atone for it. Christ atones for your sin. We don't have to go on and on with it. But as our lesson here says, we go on towards fidelity from here on inwards. Not turning to the left or to the right, but serving with all heart. And this theme has come up. Over and over again we found in our Bible studies in the last couple of years. Some of us grieved terribly about the sin that we fell into, that huge mistake that we made years ago, and how to get over it. And I think it's worthwhile, just for the sake of um, those of us who are new to the group, and maybe just to remind ourselves, just remind you of that story that I told last year of the President James Garfield, who was the 20th President of the United States. He came into office in March of that year and he began quite well, although these first few months were quite difficult. But in 18-1 in July there, a man tried to kill him and assassinate him with a gun and he shot him twice. The first bullet skinned across his elbow and the second one hit him in the back and lodged just fast the, the vertebrae and lodged in his abdomen. And he fell to the ground there and he was in a busy train station and within a few minutes there were half a dozen doctors all over him and they were, the first thing they were trying to do was get the bullet out of the wound. And in those days before the, yeah, the learning of men like Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister with germs and uh, antiseptics there, they started to probe the wound with their unwashed fingers to get the bullet out, the first thing they did. And they spent an hour with him on the floor of the train station and couldn't get it. And eventually they 
got him up and got him back to a bedroom in the White House and it began again. Hours and hours were spent again trying to enlarge the gap there to make the hands in there to get this bullet out. It went on for ages, for weeks and weeks as this man grew weaker. One point they even brought in Alexander Graham Bell with a new prototype of a metal detecting machine there to try and find it but it didn't give a true reading because of the metal bed springs on the bed there was distorted and they still couldn't find it there. And the man suffered and suffered and over those months to come they just kept on intruding upon this wound with their fingers there over and over again to get this one. Eventually his agonies came to the end, I think it was on about the 10th of September when he finally passed away and the relief of death came upon him. He'd gone from 210 pounds down to about 130 pounds and known nothing but agony. He didn't die from the bullet wound, he died from sepsis. He kept picking and picking at the wound. Leave it alone. It happened, you've done it, you can't rewind, you can't make it good. <coughs> What does God say after we fall into a great sin and a great failure? He says, move on, carry on. What does the devil say? The devil says, well, I think you should think long and hard about this mess. <laughs> Why not go back and relive it again? Why not just sit down there, utterly impotent in your chair, and go over and over and over again what you've done? Let's go back through the rubbish dump again and dig it all out again. All your fears and all your failings, all your wickedness, your rebellion, your backslidings, your hypocrisy. You can't just walk away from that like you're innocent, can you? You need to go over this again. You're disqualified. You've got to forfeit your future for what you've done. And God says, no, <laughs> I saw that before the foundation of the world. I saw what you were going to do and what you were going to be, and I paid for it before the foundation of the world. It's all been paid for in my son. Now move on. Leave it alone. How can he do that? <laughs> How can God do that? How can he have anything further to do with the people who have committed such treason against him? How can he reveal it so painfully and then instantly follow it up with, do not fear? He can do it because he's a covenant keeping God. In verse 22, the Lord will not forsake his people for his name's sake because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. And God made a decision to have a people and nothing is going to change his mind. <laughs> He's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. His whole name and reputation are wrapped up in this one. This is grace greater than all our sin. You can't reverse the irreversible and what a word this is for the downcast. <laughs> you don't believe the lie that the great sin back there in your life was the first time that God ever encountered such a disaster as that. There's a contrast here. You can't blot out verse 22. But he can blot out your sin. If you still don't believe me, <laughs> listen to the Apostle Paul who said in Romans 5.20 where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now this is the lesson for this week. You must see that your great evil and you must also see that his great steadfastness that will never, no never, no never forsake. It's by grace alone that we have become his people and it's by grace alone that we remain his people. What do you do with a God like that? You worship him. <laughs> I rather think this is what David was referring to as the beauty of the Lord when he wrote about it in Psalm 27 verse 4. Moving on to verse 23. But as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. You understand that there's two kinds of sin. We speak about them as the Lord, the sins of commission and the sins of omission. The sins that we do and the sins that we fail to do, where we fail to do what we ought to do. James chapter 4 verse 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And here in this verse here, 23, we stumble on a very common sin of omission. 
far be it for me that I should sin against you for the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But if you look very carefully at verse 23, it's not just the sin of prayerlessness, it's the sin of ceasing to pray. It's the leaving off of praying, discontinuing to pray. And this is the duty of every Christian, is to pray. Not everyone can preach, not everyone can teach, not everyone can evangelise, not everyone can be a pastor, not everyone can be a missionary, either home or abroad. We're not all made that way, we're all different office, but everyone can pray, without exception. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant. Don't quit. Don't give up. Persevere. And there's a couple of reasons why I need to just dwell on this one briefly in closing there. Just the first reason why we should never cease to pray. Because you despise the, Christ, the cross of Christ in doing so. And you say, well, that's, that's a bit strong, isn't it? You're going a bit heavy with that one. Well, one of the great privileges that we have is that has been given to us, has been purchased for us, is by the blood and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary is the right of access into the grace in which we now stand. We have the right into the very throne room of the God of all grace. Any time, any hour of the day, we have the right to go in there. And he did this not when we were his friends. We were never that. He secured this when we were his enemies. By the shedding of his blood, the opening of his veins there for our benefit. <coughs> Not everyone has this right to do so. This isn't given to everybody. It didn't come cheap, and it didn't come easy. This was very, very expensive. It wasn't afforded even at a great price. This was afforded to it at an infinite price. Are we going to disregard that and ceasing to pray? Can we squander our time on lesser works and fail to enter into that which could have never been too available to us if Christ had opened his veins on the cross on our behalf. I found a quote this week by J.C. Ryle, the Anglican bishop in, uh, back in the last century, an Englishman. He once said that a man can enter heaven without education, without books or knowledge, but no man ever enters heaven without prayer. It's the life blood of a man's soul Without it, we may have a name to live, but be counted Christian, but we're dead in the sight of God. And the feeling that we must cry to God for mercy and peace is the mark of grace and the habit of spreading before him our soul's wants is an evidence that we have the, sons, the spirit of sonship. <coughs> Prayer is the appointed way to obtain the relief of our spiritual necessities. It opens up the treasury and sets the fountain flowing. If we have not, it's because we ask not. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, and they asked him to teach them to pray. So we should. But if you notice, he didn't just say, teach us how to pray. He said, teach us to pray. Every man knows how to pray. You can <coughs> speak if you can think you can pray, but will you just teach us the habit of habitual prayer without despising the cross of Christ by neglecting to do so. Another reason is that we also, the Church of Christ is deprived. There are blessings that can only come to us through prayer. We say that prayer changes things, and certainly that's true, because prayer moves the hand of the one who moves the world. Our God works through means, and one of the means that he delights to work through is through the prayers of the saints. Going back to James again, he seems to be a favourite this morning. James chapter 4, verse 2, it says, You have not, because you ask not. And again, he says, The effective, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Doesn't that mean, in contrast, that the non-existent prayer avails nothing? We wonder what blessings we miss out on in our lives, and what... Blessings are lost in the work of God and the work of the church just because we don't pray. This is the great sin there that we have of ceasing to pray. The Lord Jesus Christ gave a whole parable on this one. And it's one of the rare occasions where he actually explained the parable as it was at that time. In Luke chapter 18 he said men always ought to pray and not to faint. This is the parable of the 
the woman who wouldn't give any rest to the judge. And he said, always there. The reason here is that men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to cave in, not to give up. God forbid that I should ever cease in praying for you. And may this be a, a spirit and attitude that we adopt particularly for one another in this place. We do live in turbulent times and we don't know what the future holds and certainly we are behind <coughs> Enemy lines in the battlefield. God forbid that we should ever cease in praying for one another, particularly, and for our loved ones. Sometimes you know your families are probably the same with mine. You just want to give up and wash your hands. It's too late. God have no. Don't ever quit. Your prayers will outlive you. There might be many answers to your prayers that you won't see in your lifetime, but one day you might walk up and wake up in glory and you'll look and somebody coming through the pearly glades that you'd given up on years ago. Let's never <clears throat> cease to pray for that. So there's chapter 12 there, and hopefully God willing, we'll move on to chapter 13 next year. Uh, next, next year? We'll next year. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's just close in prayer then before we go next door.